I've been an EMT for about three years now. I live and work in Southern California, and this particular transport happened just four months into my job at a private ambulance company. This company was a private BLS, or basic life support company primarily, and we typically transported patients whose care provider had a contract with us. However, sometimes we would run 911 calls out of prisons. This is where our story begins. It was late into the night at the station when we received a call for a priority response to a state prison for an unknown medical. I walked over to my partner who was sleeping on our wrecked area couch and woke him up. We hopped into the rig, the engine roared to life, and we set off, lights blazing, sirens wailing. As we approached the prison, we killed the lights and sirens and proceeded with the routine security check. Once the guards were satisfied with the search, we were given access, led through the gates, and parked outside the medical bay. With a gurney and medical equipment in tow, we entered the prison hospital. I was going to be the primary care provider for this patient, and though I had been a pretty new EMT, I had done a lot of prison transports in a small amount of time. I've had patients scream at me, try to bribe me, and yes, even try to kill me. So, as you can imagine, I wasn't really looking forward to fight night on Unit 221 at 4 in the morning. Regardless, I always prepared for the worst. We were escorted in by the guards as usual and led into the main area of the hospital rooms which were still fitted as cells. I was approached by a nurse who gave me a sheet of paper with his information and his most recent vitals. I started to ask for the turnover report, why this patient even required transport and where we were transporting him to. But the nurse just stared blankly for a moment and then she said, you're going to Scripps Mercy Shores Hospital, room 329. He's going because he doesn't feel well and he needs some tests done. He shouldn't be a problem for you. Already, alarms started to go off in my head. Scripps Mercy Shores is a rich people hospital. I've never heard of anyone other than someone wealthy going there, let alone a prisoner. Second, not feeling well and needs tests didn't really paint me a great picture for why he needs to go and what I would be dealing with. And finally, what does he shouldn't be a problem for you mean? If he's a violent inmate or even an at-risk patient, they would normally just say so. Getting an actual report on this patient's health and medical condition was like getting blood from a stone. I decided to just relent and go ahead with the transport. The prison guards brought the shackled patient out to us, which was another oddity because every other time I would go in and talk with them before getting them onto the gurney. Standing before me was a tall, rather frail-looking man of dark complexion. His eyes were red and sunken. His overall demeanor was a fearful one. He was constantly shivering, and he looked like hell. I introduced myself and began my whole checklist of things to ask and address. We'll call him David. He answered all of my questions with a small and quivering voice. When I asked him what the problem was tonight, he just gave a quick and frightened glance towards the guards and the nurse and said he didn't feel well. His reply sounded forced and rehearsed. Abuse from the staff came to mind first, but I'd address that later. I decided to just go ahead and get this guy going and I would wrap everything up in the ambulance. So before loading him in, I asked him the same question that I ask all of the inmate patients. Be straight with me and I'll be straight with you. Are you going to cause problems once we get going? He quickly shook his head no and then we were off. When transporting prisoners, one guard accompanies in the ambulance and another follows in what's called a tail car. This is for everyone's safety and it ensures that if the patient tries anything, an official guard is there to address it. I was busy writing up my report when I realized that between the confusion of the call and the late hour, I had forgotten to get my own set of vitals. Mm, rookie mistake. We were about halfway to our destination and the patient had remained silent this whole time. I told him I was going to take his vitals and instructed him to give me his arm so I could begin. He did so immediately, like he was trained to obey anything that was demanded of him. And he did so with a haunting look of fear. I wrapped my blood pressure cuff around his arm and that's when I felt him for the first time. His skin was ice cold. There wasn't even a slight warmth to his skin. I asked him if he'd like a blanket, but he declined. I continued with my evaluation. I inflated the cuff, pressed my stethoscope to his brachial artery, and listened for the pulse to come back to show me his blood pressure. It didn't come back. 
At first, I simply thought my stethoscope was broken. So I grabbed another one. Same thing. No pulse. I removed all of my equipment and felt for his pulse myself. I looked at him and I asked him if he felt okay. He just answered with a simple, quiet, I'm okay, thank you. I took another set of vitals to see if I misread something, but they all came back the same. Heart rate, zero. Blood pressure, zero. Blood oxygen level, zero. The only thing consistent was his respiratory rate, which was 24 breaths a minute. A bit higher than resting rate, but not alarming in itself. I looked back again and asked him once more if he was okay. He looked me in the eyes and nodded and said yes as tears welled up in his eyes and then he looked away. He was completely alert. He responded perfectly to all of my questions. His eyes were equal and reactive, all signs of good brain function, but no signs of a pulse or any vascular activity. At this point, I didn't know what to think. Scientifically, there is no reason this guy should be alive. Even if he had an artificial heart, he would be showing vital signs and have a battery pack with a filter kit. But he's right in front of me, alert, breathing, talking when addressed. It makes absolutely no sense. I decided to continue investigating, and I listened to his heart again with my stethoscope. There was no beating, no thumping, just the muffled sounds of his breathing. I listened to his lungs, and they were all clear, all normal. I had just finished listening to his chest when we pulled into our destination. We offloaded him from the ambulance, took him to the room where we were instructed to. Then, he hopped off the gurney and was escorted to his hospital bed by the guards. I began giving my almost unbelievable turnover report to the nurse, who surprisingly didn't even seem a bit alarmed by it. All doctors to the ER. I wrapped up my turnover and then sat in a nearby chair to finish up my report. As I sat, typing away at my computer, I'm interrupted by the sound of a hospital gurney rolling down the hallway. It was accompanied by four people in surgical gowns who entered the inmate's room. After a few minutes, the team in surgical attire emerges from the room. The inmate is strapped down to the gurney with restraints and he is audibly crying. And they wheel him down to the hall and then around the corner. That was the last time that I saw him. I told my partner about it once we were back in the ambulance, but he didn't believe me at first, which I could understand because I do joke around a lot. But with the look that I gave him, he knew that I was not joking. This story may not be what you are expecting. It's not violent or particularly frightening, but this was hands down the most disturbing call that I've ever had. I don't know what I saw. I don't know what I transported. I have my theories such as experimental treatments being carried out on inmates. But with skin like ice, hardly any vital signs, and such a fearful demeanor, I can only wonder what kind of experiments and what kind of horrors that man had faced. This just happened to me, my sister, my friend, and her boyfriend. If I hadn't witnessed this, I would not believe it myself. I live in a different city than my friend and we live about four hours from each other. So we made plans months ago to go shop for her wedding dress. And it was a successful day. She said yes to the dress and we ended the day by meeting at her house to eat and relax. Some of the other friends had other things going on so they weren't able to come over. So I invited my sister to come and hang out with us. She also lives in the same city as my friend so it ended up being the three of us hanging out. While my friend's boyfriend was in the house, he wasn't in the same room as us. So we had a great night eating, chatting, and watching Netflix. After we watched some movies, my friend decided that she was tired and she would go to bed. My sister and I stayed up and watched a docu-series that we were both interested in before we went to sleep. Around the second episode, my friend's dog started barking. Not really weird because they do that to people when you walk by the room that they stay in because it's on the way to the bathroom. But you can also see the front door on your way to the bathroom. This last time I went to the bathroom though, they wouldn't stop barking even after I was out of sight. So we just decided to ignore them, thinking that it would stop, just like the times before. But they went on long enough that it woke my friend up. We heard her get up and tell the dogs to be quiet. Then she came into the living room and asked if we heard the doorbell. We were both really confused because the show wasn't loud and we had it turned down very low. So we didn't disturb my friend and her boyfriend while they slept. We both answered no, followed by me saying we didn't hear anything. The dogs were barking, but we didn't hear anything else. She gave us a confused look and said the doorbell camera notified my phone that someone rang the doorbell. She said it was a white guy with 
like a briefcase. You sure you didn't hear it? We both said no again, and she shrugged her shoulders and said that she was going back to bed. My sister and I finished the series that we were watching around for that morning. I didn't want her to go out to her car at night, especially after that weird encounter. So she agreed to stay the night and we'd talk more about it in the morning. So we both woke up around 10 and my friend and her boyfriend were in the kitchen for breakfast. My friend repeated the description and when I asked to see the footage, she said we went back to look for the footage, but we couldn't find it. I woke up because of the dogs, but when I picked up my phone, I had a notification that someone was at the door. There was a little preview to see before you opened it, and I opened it because it was a man. I woke up my boyfriend to take a look with me, and he saw what I saw. A white man with a briefcase. Neither of us can find the footage, but we both saw it on the camera last night while he was there. She also said by the time that she came out to check, there was no one at the door. She didn't need to open the door because they have a glass window that shows outlines of anybody that's on the other side of the door, but not any distinctive features. She didn't see anyone, and that's when she came to ask us about not hearing anything. She even demonstrated how distinct the doorbell sounds by going out and pressing the doorbell that morning. It's fairly loud, but me and my sister didn't hear anything like that last night. Was it a skinwalker? My sister said something about a mimic and how they pretend to be people or pets. Does anybody know what it could have been or did we all hallucinate because we were tired and not fully aware? But how would my friend and her boyfriend see the same thing on the screen that night? But with no footage to find, did it really happen? I don't know, but I'm so glad that I didn't see anything when I walked by the front door on my way to the bathroom.